Yeah, that is sort of like the, the, the offline equivalent of somebody finding an address book and, and literally ringing every number in there. Or, or yeah, or, 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 or text text all your contacts, you know, like... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, text to all. Yeah. Text to all, that, that sort of thing. So it, it was very similar to that, but it's just that in their case, you know, all was the entire internet. With the original Unix systems where we had a system called Write where you could write to other people. And that was very handy. Um, to, in fact... Uh, I'll do a quick uh, screen uh, grab of uh, that working. This then is an attempt to try and reconstruct what it looked a little like uh, in the 1980s when we were all working on uh, mainframe or mini computers at that time. So in this case it was a PDP-1170 which was sitting in the basement. There were terminals all around the building, all physically wired in, so there's a wire from each terminal down through the trunking to the basement and plugged into the back of the PDP-1170. There was a room with about 20 or so terminals that were general use, and then uh, the staff people all had terminals in their own office. And you'd sit down at the terminal and you'd log in and do whatever you were going to do. Often the first thing you would type is who, which would show you who is connected onto the computer, who is logged in and who is available and this is kind of a, a common thing I would see early on. Uh, there's Dave Brailsford logged in, Eric Foxley, Andy Walker, William Armitage and a computer file and also me of course. As uh, systems evolved a little we, we had another command called W which did much the same thing. You could see uh, who's logged in there and uh, also what they're running. Um, in this case they're all running the shell but you could also see the idle time there, this, this column down here. That would give you a, an idea of whether they had recently done anything on the computer or whether they'd wandered away. So if you wanted to go and talk to someone, you could see if they were actually at their computer. Even better than that, you could uh, uh, communicate directly with them. So there was a small utility called Write, which allowed you to write to somebody else. And this obviously saved you walking around the building to try and find them. If you could see they were logged in and uh, available, you could just go ahead and say write uh, DFB in this case. And uh, down here, you can see uh, a message has appeared. And, uh, you then type and uh, it would appear there. And uh, DFB could write back. And you know, it's, it's quite primitive, but uh, we, we used it quite a lot. And write was actually a very simple program. It just uh, you know, read a line and wrote it to uh, the user's device. That was really very useful during the early days that, uh, because in the early days we were all connected to the same computer and we were all sort of a, a big community. And uh, if you did something that used up a lot of uh, processing power or something, everybody would shout at you and you'd get to uh, these messages coming to you. But it was also, Good just to uh, before wandering around the apartment to go and see if uh, anybody was uh, logged into the computer and you could go and chat to them. And you can actually see uh, the user's device here if you type who, then this this line here, this TTY or, or a pseudo TTY in this case, is, is the actual uh, device. And that's actually a device in the file system on Unix, so you could actually look at that. So PTS. Two is DFBs, although the security has been uh, up since then, so I've had to play a couple of tricks to get this to work. You can actually do that directly. You can just and just echo something straight into that file, and it appears over here on on this file. So that's you know it's really quite simple. Uh, as I say, uh, security has improved since then, so you can't do that now. And even then, though, you could say message, and that says either yes or no. So you could say message, no, I don't want to, to receive messages. So if he now tried to write it back, then it would say, I'm sorry, uh, he doesn't want to be communicated to at the moment if you're busy. But usually most people ran with that on. Whatever you happen to be doing, it just appeared in the middle of your screen. So if you're in the middle of an editor, um, so if I put that back on, Start editing something here. Uh, then th this just appears splashed across your screen and you, you have to refresh it to get rid of it. So that was uh, one system. It's kind of like a precursor to the instant messaging, I guess, but uh, very, very, very primitive as uh, 
as, as you might show in uh, some of the screen grabs. Uh, then we also had this program called Wall, which was uh, sort of a uh, building up from that from right to all users. And that was typically used either if things got desperate on the computers that uh, somebody was using far too much CPU and it was affecting everybody, somebody might send a wall message to all the users saying, OK, own up, who's burning through all the CPU that's slowing all my stuff down. But it was also part of the shutdown process. If you, if you tried to shut down the computer, then usually you'd give it a time and say shut down in five minutes and it would broadcast this message to all the users saying the machine is going down. But it, that used this command called wall and and uh, that would appear on everybody's terminal. So uh, that was quite uh, a useful thing. We didn't, I don't think you could use uh, wall as a regular user. I think you had to be a system admin because it you know, splattered across every one's uh, terminals. It was quite fun as um, we had this room called C30 with uh, banks of terminals. And when somebody sent a wall message, it would sort of appear on the first one, second, accompanied by a load of beeps as well. So it would sort of ripple across the whole terminal room saying uh, the machine is going down. And uh, you certainly knew about it because uh, they had quite a loud beep, these TBI 912s. Then as we slowly moved into the sort of uh, internet networking version of this, I remember we received our first couple of sun machines in the department and uh, I started looking at those and seeing what uh, commands they had. They had another new command called talk where you could, that was a bit more interactive and you could chat with somebody with this. It was only two ways, I remember. Uh, I think it may have been extended into multi-way later, but that was basically like the right. You just typed in stuff and uh, uh, you, you could see it. But uh, amongst the uh, commands that you got with the new Sun system, now that we're all networked, was a load of commands that all started with R. So there's an R shell to log in remotely to a computer, which has been subsumed by SSH now, a secure shell, because it certainly wasn't secure. Uh, there was an R exec to run programs. There was, um, I think there was an R who and a few other things. But, but you had a bunch of these new commands all with the letter R in front of them. And uh, while I was looking through them, I discovered this command called R wall, which was the remote version of wall. So you could write to all users across the network. And I do remember looking at this and there was some configuration examples. And one of the configurations, it had this file called netgroups that said, this is a, a sort of a shorthand for who you want to contact. So you could sort of say our wall to all the people on your local network or, or uh, pick out a specific set of machines that it would broadcast to. But I do remember looking at it and thinking this is a bit odd because there's a universal group there and they defined the universal group as sort of the absence of everything. So you could say, I think, which users you want to talk to, which machines and which networks. But if you missed all of those out, then the default was to send it to everywhere. Um, literally everywhere. Literally everywhere. And that was fine on uh, at uh, Nottingham because there was only like about 10 computers on the network at this point. So um, I never did try it out, but you know, the worst that could happen was it would affect 10 computers. Anyway, uh, getting to the, uh, the crux of the story. So uh, this was... Uh, uh, something that happened in 1987, March the 31st, actually. And it was uh, started by Jordan Hubbard, who uh, was quite well known at the time. I think he was, he was quite uh, well known in the uh, early internet. He did a lot of good work with uh, free software and so on. And he was manager of uh, one of Berkeley's um, distributed uh, computing groups at the time. And he too, like me, I suspect, looked at uh, these new commands and said, oh, this R wall thing, oh, that, that, that could be interesting. I'll, I'll send a quick message to all the people on the network. And uh, this universal group seems to be what, uh, what um, is needed to uh, send it around. So he, he uh, sent a quick message using this R wall command and uh, not quite realizing what happened. Uh, it, it didn't come back instantly. Usually it comes back quite quickly and says, yes, uh, done done that, but it didn't. So he sort of left it and wandered off uh, and uh, went off to see if anybody had received it. And when he got back to his uh, workstation and sat down, he did work out that quite a lot of people had received it. In fact, everybody on the internet at the time <laughs> was starting to receive this. So he killed the 
programme, but by that time uh, <laughs> the damage was done. And he started getting a flood of emails. Uh, in fact, he got 743 emails from people all around the internet, uh, including because at this time the internet and the ARPANET were still somewhat connected, so uh, they hadn't really uh, set off the, the military part from the regular internet. So this sort of went you know, around places like the Pentagon, um, you know, the, the ARPANET management. Everybody suddenly got this message splattered across their screen saying... What was the message? What did he actually send? I, I don't know what the message was, actually. I think it was just something innocuous like, hello, um, <laughs> whatever. But, but it was always preceded by quite a few lines saying, uh, this is a broadcast message from whoever, and uh, you've got quite a lot of the bell command, the bell characters. So it went ding, 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 ding on your terminal and then went across. And on the sun, you, you typically, like, like you do now, you have several windows open. Well, it, but it sort of hit every window there. So, so it's flat across every window saying um, you know, something, something important like, um, hi, guys, I'm just testing this out or something like that. <laughs> So uh, it caused quite a stir at the time, and apparently the, some of the high up people in the internet uh, were extremely annoyed by this. And there was um, the elders um, of the internet. Position. Yes, they, they contacted Sun and said, "You know, what the hell do you think you're doing, letting people just do this sort of thing?" And uh, we demand this is patched in your very next release and uh, get a quick fix out. All this thing. Uh, Jordan, meanwhile, was um, you know he he uh, was. Uh, obviously um, inundated with messages. I said 743 messages, which he, uh, to his credit, replied to each one individually with sort of a stock answer. So there's quite a few versions of that floating around. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little unfortunate, you know, he, he's done a lot of good work. Uh, I think he works for NVIDIA now. So yeah, you know, he's a very talented software engineer, but if you look at his Wikipedia page, it, does list a few of those things, but half of it is about this R wall incident that uh, that triggered. He probably made a few friends doing that, actually. <laughs> I think it's probably 50 50 uh, <laughs> when you get to look at it. There's certainly a lot of people. You know, it wasn't malicious at all or anything like that. It was just annoying. At that time, was Nottingham on the internet? No, we weren't. We were sort of. We had a bridge to the internet, and uh, so it, it, it was. Yeah, it wouldn't have queued and waited to get to you then. It no, was more kind of uh, whoever's there right now. Yeah. yeah, I think it got to University College London, who we worked with quite a lot in those days, and they were on the end of a satellite uh, link at that point. I think it got through to them. I think I had a few uh, friends who who got it, but it luckily it didn't get through to us, and uh, I guess it didn't get through to everyone because apparently the way it worked was it said, "Oh." This this is going to everybody. Right, I will go through all the, the list of known hosts on your computer and just go through one at a time, contacting each and send send it off there. And at that point, we hadn't got the DNS. It was still a sort of um, a host list file. So it just went all the way through there and uh, sent it. And because they were actually very well connected at Berkeley to the internet, it, um, it, it managed to get everywhere. Right, so we're here. We can't go to S, we can only go to L. That's a nice easy one, so I need to find L. So L goes to C, and it's three plus two is five. So L comes in just under one column to start with. And each of these nodes within the network has connections to other nodes. This is how you initialize a network.